Welcome to our next unit on the evaluation of ML systems. This unit discusses visual measures for binary classification systems in imbalanced settings and where no cost matrix is known. In our first unit on ROC analysis, I introduced various metrics for the evaluation of binary classification systems with imbalanced class labels. Among those were the true positive rate, which was the percentage from the positive class that we also predicted as being positive, and the false positive rate, which is the percentage of negative class that we erroneously predict as being positive. Both measures range between 0 and 1 or 0 and 100, if given in percentage points. If we plot these two measures, like in this example here, we can compare several models with, with each other. This plot here is called ROC space. In the previous unit, we learned that it is difficult to objectively combine two conflicting measures like PPV and TPR, and also FPR and TPR, without knowing the costs of different incorrect or also correct decisions. So if we don't have extra information, why not just keep the two conflicting measures apart and visualize them on their own without combining them in an unclear manner? This is, this is exactly what the ROC space does. For each classification system under consideration, we simply calculate the TPR and FPR, and then we plot it in this coordinate system here, where we put FPR on the x-axis and the TPR on the y-axis. Of course, we could do the same for other measures like TPR and PPV, as in the F1 measure. In this unit, we focus on the TPR and FPR, as these are the most commonly plotted in such a fashion. Now, by plotting the measures of different models in one plot, we can try to visually pick our preferred model. In this example, it is pretty clear that if we compare model C1 to model C3, that C1 is better. It is not only better with respect to FPR, where lower is better, but also with respect to TPR, where greater is better. If we compare C1 with C2, however, the situation is much less clear. C1 has a lower FPR value, but C2 has a higher TPR value. And again, without extra information on misclassification costs, we can't decide which of these two systems is preferable. Obviously, the best ever potential system is located in the top left corner. That is because it has both a true positive rate of 1 and a false positive rate of 0. That can only happen if we produce zero errors on the positive class and on the negative class. And of course, if that happens, we don't really have to talk about costs, right? Normally, if we would see such a solution in a real world problem, we might worry a bit about label leakage or some other error we might have introduced into our evaluation procedure. It's just too good. Models which lie on the diagonal are not so good. They're as good as random. Imagine a classifier which produces random labels, random 0, 1 labels, without looking at the features. Then this classifier would be somewhere on the diagonal, depending on with which probability the classifier predicts positive class. For example, a random classifier predicts positive class with a probability of 25%. Then we'd get on average a TPR of 0.25 and an FPR of 0.25. If the classifier would predict positive class with a probability of 75%, again, without any useful assignment, but randomly, then both TPR and FPR are 0.75. If we have a classifier to classify all as ones, all as positive, we will correctly classify all positives as positive. So TPR would be one. 
At the same time, however, we would also classify all negatives as positives. So FPR would also be one. If we somehow me manage to get a classifier which, below, which lies below the diagonal, then we did something deeply wrong. In practice, we should never see something like that. It is very likely that if we get a classifier that lies somewhere in the right bottom corner, then we made some mistake. Like, for example, we might have accidentally switched labels. Because if we invert the predicted labels, so if we say positives are now negative and vice versa, then the point in the ROC space will be mirrored where our original classifier lies. Initially, we discussed that we use ROC metrics in cases of imbalanced class distribution. Let's now look at two example, examples where we see this properly. In the first example, we have as many positive cases as we have ne negatives, so a balanced case. In the second example, we have double the amount of positives. Let's assume that we have one classifier, which then results in two tables um, shown for the two examples respectively here. It is the same classifier, so we should have the same performance in both cases, right? However, if we look at the misclassification error, we get different values. It seems that the classifier is better in example one, just because of class imbalance. If it is not immediately clear to you why this is the case, stop the video now, look up the formula for the MCE and compute it yourself. The ROC measures true positive rate and false positive rate are the same for both examples. The reason for this is that they are computed as rates. This is a nice property and these measures um, help us avoid confusion in settings with unbalanced samples. But be careful, if you have an unbalanced data set for training, you may still get different results, of course. This example here only works because the model is fixed. It's the same for both examples. If the model were different in the two examples and also based on differently balanced training samples, we would most likely get different results. With um, ROC measures, we can look at binary classifiers, which produce label predictions. Now, remember that scoring classifiers and probabilistic classifiers can also output label predictions if we give them a threshold. If we have a probabilistic classifier, it will give us a probability of seeing the positive class for a certain observation. To get the label, we can say for example, if the probability of seeing positive is above 50%, we predict positive and vice versa for negative. Instead of 50%, we could also, of course, use a different value, for example, 45%. Um, and the same can be done for scoring classifiers. We just set a threshold for the score instead of for the probability. We can now evaluate this discretized system with any performance metric that is possible for the discrete class labels, TPR, FPR, F1, misclassification error, and so on. A difficulty with the thresholding is that we don't know the best threshold. And we also can't optimize for a perfect threshold because we don't have a single performance metric available in this imbalanced situation with unknown costs. What we can do though, is go through all possible thresholds and compute the respective measures. There's one visualization measure that um, does exactly that and which is used in a lot um, of ML analyses. It is called the ROC curve. Let's go through the steps of computing the values needed for the plot by going through, it, through an example. Here we have an example data set with 12 observations. We have one column 
uh, we have the true outcome, positive or negative, and in one column, the predicted score. In this example, possible scores range between 0 and 1. The observations are sorted by predicted score from high to low. And now to compute the ROC curve, we start with the highest threshold possible, which is a value of 1, which yields a TPR of 0 and, a T and an FPR of 0 as well. This is because a threshold of 1 will assign everyone to the negative class. So we draw a dot in the origin. Next, we set a threshold to something between the first and the second score, say 0.9. Now, because this blue observation here now that's uh, marked in blue um, is from the positive class, I know that my false positive rate stays the same by, because I haven't changed anything from the negative class. But um, this positive example I have now correctly labeled as positive, so my TPR goes up a bit and I can actually calculate how much it goes up. Because there's only six elements in the positive class, it will go up by one sixth, which is about 0 0.167. In the next step, we select the threshold between the second and the th third observation, so 0 0.85. TPR again goes up by one sixth, and FPR stays the same, as again the observation is positive. Now the third threshold is 0.66, and as this third observation is again positive, we jump by, um, by 1, 6 on the y-axis. The fourth observation is actually negative, so if we take a threshold below 0.65, the FPR increases. For a threshold of 0.6, for example, we get an FPR of 0.167 because a one out of six negative observations is now classified as positive. Um, now we do this um, for every possible threshold. And um, well, finally, we get a curve which starts in 0, 0 and goes to 1, 1. Now, what do we look for in an ROC curve? The closer the curve is to the top left corner, the better it is. If curves don't cross, it is easy to identify which algorithm is better. If they do cross, we have to think more carefully again. We have to think about thresholds we deem reasonable and about what is important to us. Well, since people really like one single number to make decisions, the ROC curve can be boiled down to one number again. As we said, the more to the top left the ROC curve goes, the better. This means the greater the area under the ROC curve, the better. An optimal value is an area under the curve of 1. A pretty awful area under the curve is one of 0.5. The area under the curve is also called AUC for area under curve. We can interpret the AOC as a probability, the probability that a classifier ranks uh, a random positive higher than a random negative observation. So as an example, we take a random positive observation from a data set and a random negative observation. If our AOC is for example, 0.92, then the probability that the positive is ranked higher than the negative observation is 92%. Note that by boiling down the curve into one number, we lose information. Looking at the ROC curve is way more informative and should, if possible, be used. Especially since the AUC integrates over large portions of the curve that you're typically not very interested in. Think about medical applications where you really want an extreme high true positive rate because lowering the true positive rate means sending people home who are sick. In these cases, of course, we can also use something where we look at a specific region of the ROC curve where we can use 
the so-called partial AUC. The interpretation now, of course, changes, but the measure can still be used to compare the performance of models. In the figures here, we show two examples of uh, partial AUC. The first focuses on a region with low FPR and the second on the region with high TPR. But again, the AUC gives us one single value where looking at the plotted curve can give us much more information.